Welcome back to Painting From Life at East Oak Studio. Uh, we're super excited because we're trying to do it on two platforms today. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us, uh, whoever is on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, please leave any comments and on either platform and we will try to get to them. So Divya is behind the switcher and Caroline's behind the switcher. And Alex and I will be painting today again. And um, then we also have Kristen, who is also one of our artists in resident here. And she will be just uh, entering in on the conversation. Uh, and she's sketching in the background. So, uh, so glad that y'all are here. Looking forward to it. Please paint along with us. Uh, go to uh, eastoakstudio.com. We'll make sure to also put a link below for the future. Uh, to sign up, all you need to do is give us, uh, send, put in your email, and then we will send you the reference images. We have the lovely Brittany here this evening. She is a local entrepreneur here in town, and uh, we're really excited about having her um, model for us today. So, hope everyone enjoys this time and look forward to painting along with you. Um, make sure that you uh, post. We're also going to have our uh, Instagram tag down below. Make sure uh, you post what you've uh, done if you've worked uh, with us while we've been painting. So, all right, without further ado, let's get started. And as usual, I'm gonna like fix one or two things before I put brush to palette, but we'll put the camera on, on Alex. All right, it's been rather quiet um, <laughs> while I'm in the background working on a couple of things. So, how is everybody? <laughs> I'll ask those questions and then, and then be like, British, be still. <laughs> Everybody's allowed to answer but you. <laughs> Who, me? 
I'm doing uh, great. As always, you know, when we're doing one of these productions, I, I really get excited about them, but I'm always quite a, a, a little frazzled trying to get them up and running. Um, so it doesn't matter how much time I spend getting everything ready and how it, it'll be two days earlier and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get everything ready two days prior. For some reason, it always creeps up on you in the last minute and there's like 16 different things that seem to go wrong at the very end. <laughs> so, um, so now that I'm at the canvas, I am happy and I'm good. So ready to put a brush to canvas. So, how is everybody out in the YouTube world? Y'all need to uh, send us a text or a comment on there. Let us know where you're from. If y'all have any questions while we sit here and have fun painting. And I'm sure that Kristen or somebody will inform me if I'm like too much in the, in the way of my painting. So that y'all can see. But I wonder how the quarantine life is for everyone. Everybody trying to stay sane. So y'all believe this is Brittany's first time modeling. I hope y'all like the reference images. We were just joking earlier about how she has a million dollar smile, but it would be really hard to hold a smile that good <laughs> for, for the foreseeable like three hours or 12 hours. We told you it was 12 hours, right? <laughs> no. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's fine. Her eye starts twitching you know, in like hour 10. You know, this is just like a big marathon. this on, on the canvas. I'm starting to practice my like Bob Ross soft voice today. It's one of the things on my agenda. Just make this painting what you want it to be. It's your universe. <laughs> Happy trees. Oh, there's no trees in this. Well, I, um, I use, I kind of use two different mixtures and it's just depending on how lazy I am. Um, one of them, if I'm not being lazy, I, I tend to like to mix uh, ultramarine blue and transparent oxide red together and that makes like a neutral, but I can make it warmer if I add more transparent oxide red and I can make it cooler and more neutral and more gray if I add more ultramarine blue. And it kind of gives like a variance in there. Um, but for, in this case, I, um, I think I actually did that for this case. But if I'm being lazy, I'll just be like, you know, raw, raw umber is kind of like a good balance right in between the two. And I'll just cover it in raw umber and that's good as well, you know. Yeah, that's what mine is. Just some like Windsor Newton raw umber. And Windsor and Newton is nice because it's not that strong, so mm. it kind of just gives you a neutral, yellowy, nice color. Yep. Oh, we have a question? What's the question? How long does it usually take to lay down the first layer? Ooh. You know, inflate to the time um, that we have available to us is how long we'll spend on something. So if you have 10 minutes, you'll spend, you know, about 
30 second or uh, what about three or four minutes of time doing it you know um, but if you have three hours I'll end up spending like a whole hour <laughs> working yeah. on just that you know so if I had three years I'd probably spend a whole year on it <laughs> so let's just say a good rule of thumb maybe the third a third of the time so the you know, the first layer I guess it depends for like a actual studio painting let's say of like a portrait be like a day like a full day or something mm. mm -hmm. but yeah it's true if you only had if you only had a day to do a whole painting and then you do it in like two hours or something right Oh, awesome. That's, that's great because I spent like the entire day trying to make sure it did look good. <laughs> so I appreciate that affirmation. And Gail says, thanks for doing this again. So glad we can all chat more. Oh, thanks for joining us, Gail. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, we're planning on doing these, you know, staying as consistent as we can with them. We doing due to all the craziness last year, I just feel like, um, you know, things were kind of um, hard to get anything off the ground. You know, we're all playing kind of scrambling and playing catch up. So it's kind of nice to start finding a rhythm and routine again. So um, hopefully that will this will be another of many. Oscar asks, can a portrait painter replace ivory black for Van Dyke brown? Alex, you want to take that? Well, I've just started using Van Dyke brown and from what it seems like from different manufacturers, there it's not one single color it's like a mixture of browns and black and sometimes it's like more opaque colors so like i was i'm using not on this but a van dyke brown from gamblin and it's it's like somewhat opaque so i wouldn't use it in i wouldn't use it in any like darks Whereas in sometimes something that's really nice about like ivory black is just that it's super rich and transparent. Mm. So it really depends on if you're looking for something transparent or, or opaque, but it's basically a warm black, like a brown black. So if you already, so yeah, I guess you could. But I remember looking up like the pigments in the Gamblin one and the Michael Harding one and they were like completely different so mm. depends um had a buddy who always told me he was an attorney he said the best department attorney if you ask them any question they'll all the first response will always be that depends I should have been an attorney. I find myself saying that more and more in this world. <laughs> like I ended up using the Van Dyke Brown for like a very kind of neutral wall that was mm -hmm. behind the figure I was painting. And so like it with white, instead of making like this cold black, it made more of like a neutral gray. So mm. yeah, it depends what you use black for. Well, cobalt violet light, um, I'm not sure what they're mixing into it, but basically it's just a lighter version of the cobalt violet. Um, from my understanding, you use cobalt violet light, right, Alex? Yeah. 
Um, That's the thing. I'm trying to think if it's the light or the dark. I think it's the light version. Um, I used to use the regular cobalt violet. Um, I use manganese a lot late now, but cobalt's better for glazing because it is a much more transparent and less of a tinting color. Um, and so because of that, it, um, it works really well with kind of subtly pushing things. So, mm -hmm. um, into the right hue or value that you're trying to express or trying to get a little bit more of the, that color involved. Um, so, so yeah. It's a good question. Um, manganese, if you want to use, is almost the exact same color if you just want one that has more tinting power. power. So I tend to use manganese more, but I love cobalt when I'm wanting to just subtly shift something. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I, I try to use the loudest brushes I can find. I'm just kidding. That's not a brush. <laughs> Alex, did you get that one? I was, I, oh, j um, almost, I don't know why, but none of my paints seem to slip down when I use a vertical palette. My blue, my cobalt blue is a little bit like kind of liquidy and ropey and that kind of starts to drip, but then I just scrape it back up there and try and like put a bit of pressure on it so it hopefully like grabs onto the palette better but maybe it's certain quality paints are more like watery than others because Louie you didn't do anything to make yours stay on there mm -mm. yeah just yeah. kind of yeah it doesn't stands. feel like I mean, when I used to have student grade paint, it would slide more than yeah. the nicer stuff. Yeah, that's probably the, the only thing. Kristen, it's nice having you in there on the background, girl. <laughs> Chime in more often. Well, I think that what it depends on what you're going for here. Here's my attorney answer right here. It depends. It depends on what you are trying to accomplish um, and what you hold valuable as a creative. Um, some people hold the energy of working from life, there's a particular amount of energy that you get from working uh, with a person where you're sort of, it's time saturated and uh, it allows for you to, um, it allows for you to get all these different little reactions that happen with a person over time. You know, you'll see these little different changes and shifts in their face and it's so you get to have this accumulation of all of these things. Um, that make up a painting. So some people love that quality of working from life. They also love the quality of the imperfection that you get from working from life. The other thing I would say to it is if let's say the image was perfect, you know, which a lot of times the images can be warped if you're not careful uh, on working from uh, a photo. And so the idea of it being a perfect uh, drawing can be false. Uh, it's misleading just because if you aren't using the right lens at the right distance at the right time, you, you literally are changing a person's face. And then, um, you know, 
for the most part that you have to watch out for a perspective and all of these other things. So once you've like, let's just say it is the perfect image and that you did all the things right, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you're being creative about in painting? Is it, is it the, that that's not one of the limitations? So you're trying to be creative within some other thing that's more important to you. So hyperrealism is something that a lot of people do and they're using photos to do it and that's what's created the whole phenomenon of hyperrealists. But if um, they're not interested in a painterly mark, they're interested in showing every pore and the time that it takes to like meticulously go through um, the entire photo to do that, you know. So all that to be said is, is that you have to know what it is that you're creating that's valuable to you and what is the poetry of it. And if it's not um, the drawing aspect of the, of the painting, then it should be another aspect. And some people, it's to try to mimic that photograph perfectly and do it to a degree that you couldn't tell the difference. And that's what's valuable to them. So this is a very long-winded answer, but it's one of those charged questions, <laughs> you know. Um, so some people use it to, to, to like save time as well. And, you know, uh, you say that they have a lot going on and they, they need to like make sure that they're meeting all of their deadlines. There's something to be said about that as well. So. And I feel like I've only answered half of it. I could, I could like talk another hour about it, but I'm going to try to paint too. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let somebody else tackle it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in the beginning, when I first started painting, um, I just wanted to like skip the drawing part and get to the fun part. And so projecting or tracing was like a tool I used to, you know, skip that part. But I think a lot of painting is drawing. Um, and for me, I paint very thin, and I tend to paint very thin and tight, um, and so using a projection kind of, I don't know, confines me um, to that part of my style. So I've kind of ventured out from using projections and tracing just because I want to, like you were saying, um, my goal is to be more painterly and have that looser effect. So I think it, you're so right. It's kind of that's really good here's my challenge with it if you're using it out of fear then you should try not to and try to get yourself out of a place of fear um, because you'll become a better painter poetic wise if if you don't let let the fear of not getting it right creep in um, by far the best paintings that i've done or ones that i've done from life um, and so anyway but y'all we're going to take a break and uh, we'll get back to everything in just a few minutes <laughs> oh, let's uh, get your wheels back in the spot for me real quick. Oh, look at that. <laughs> get off real quick. <laughs> 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 that's going to be difficult. I feel like it's going to move as soon as it... It's all right. I got you covered. Oh, it's stupid. I'm going to move you around. You good? Yeah. Actually, you look good? Okay. <laughs> good. That, I think the foot bar went down a little. Is it high enough for you? Yeah, is it the bar? Yeah, I'll get that. I'll get it for it. Just so you have some rest your feet on. <laughs> 
Oh, I can, my feet fine, they're fine. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> We've got a rock star model. Everybody off mute? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, audience, you got to hold us accountable. If somebody, if you can't hear somebody talking, that means they're on mute. <laughs> so let them know. Be like, I can't hear you. So Vaporwave asks, what advice would you give to beginners trying to move from fruit bowls and flowers to portraits? Make some friends <laughs> and ask them to model. Um, I mean, I, I'm a kid, but I'm, you know, I think that you should um, start drawing. Um, and, you know, I, sometimes I think that just learning the fundamentals of like how a person's structure is and, um, and how people, you know, like the general, in general forms of like what are the hallmarks of a portrait and, you know, start with that and then truly set yourself up a single light source and then try to, to uh, go from there. I'm going to turn this up just a hint. Um, but it's one of those things that the fear of, is that bothering you too much? No, it's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just making a little bit stronger shadow. Um, don't let the fear of not, uh, of like not being successful stop you. Because I mean, if, if we allowed ourselves to, um, then we'd never do anything in life, right? So that's what I would say. Yeah, go for it. It's good. I mean, the thing that I would say to beginners, start with fruit bowls and flowers. <laughs> so it's like once you feel like you've done that enough and you're pretty good at representing that, then just go for it. Alex, Ken Garcia says, what up, Alex? What up, Ken? <laughs> Ken is my friend from my hometown of Virginia Beach, and he's like literally one of the first workshops I ever took was with him. It was like a Caravaggio master copy workshop. Oh, nice. And I, I walked into this like little artist gallery on the beach, and all these people were painting Caravaggios. I was like... Oh my god, <laughs> I have to do this. Because Caravaggio was like my idol when I started. No kidding, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Gargan Deep? Asks, do you think Sergeant or Velasquez used some sort of projection device, or were they mad skilled at drawing? I don't. I know that Sergeant was definitely mad skilled at drawing. Yeah. yeah. I have not read enough about Velasquez, but I imagine he was also mad skilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you go, it's really interesting. If you go look. Um, I actually went to a Valeska's show once in New York and looked at all of his drawings. And you'd be amazed how abbreviated, like how little of information he had in them. But like that was what he worked from. And then he would just do a lot of life sittings. And so it's kind of funny because like our drawings today are way more like detailed than, mm -hmm. than what his looked like. So it's amazing that a lot of a lot of what he was doing. I mean, he just painted from life the whole time, you know. Um, and so, yeah, he most certainly was just had mad skills. Um, and doesn't that sound more fun anyway? <laughs> yeah. Oscar says Soroya used photographs, but not always. 
Who did? Sir Oscar. Oscar. <laughs> so, like, thoughts on that, maybe? Oscar uses photographs, but not always? Soroya. Soroya, that's what I was trying to find out, was who, who was it? Soroya. Well, I mean, there's tons of people that mm -hmm. have used photographs. I don't have an issue with, I mean, I use photographs a lot because there's this day and age, there's just people are busy and, and it's hard to get people to sit. And I do a lot of children and to get, I don't know if y'all have ever had, I do have them sit, but they're often, I don't know if you've ever had a five-year-old sit for you. It is, it is tough. <laughs> you know, uh, the poor kids have so much energy that sometimes your session is like 10 minutes and then you have to like go let them run and play for 30 minutes and then like it's another 10 minutes later, you know. So, uh, so there are definitely times where a photograph can help. You know, Bubaro also I think used photographs at times and I mean there's, there's tons of evidence of people using them as reference mm -hmm. so um totally not opposed to that it, it really goes back to what again what what is it that you value you know um that's that's the more important question i think yeah i think soraya did like a lot of beach scenes with like kids running and things like that like a lot of things that were in action so i can imagine it was useful mm -hmm. of a tool in that scenario mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, I know, who is it? Emil Friant, I mean, so a lot of my favorite painters, Emil Friant, Pascal Dagnon, Bouveret. There's all um, examples of how they've used photos. It's just how you, how you use a photo. Are you just copying it? Are you yeah. mm, just using it to help aid you for some reason, like for a reason? Yeah. Um, totally. One of the skills I think that I've, I'm impressed with is when I see someone translate a photo into their own work. What a lot of people uh, in our world, I talked to Josh LaRock a lot about this, and he would say, you know, sometimes I feel like when you paint from life is what he would say is when I, when you paint from life is um, it's it gives you more liberty to translate the way you want the painting to be translated or at least has more of you in it which i agree to um but that that doesn't stop you from doing that in a photo the photo sometimes just tempts you to want to translate it exactly the way yeah. it has translated mm -hmm. and so um so like the challenge or my challenge to everyone out there is is try to find unique ways to translate your work to feeling like a painting in a beautiful painting. Like use mm -hmm. the poetry of what the properties of your medium are. Otherwise, it's like, you know, why paint it if the photo has translated exactly the way it has, you know? And of course there are people out there that are doing that and that's fine, you know, I'm not knocking them. They find something valuable in, in mimicking a photograph exactly um so but for me and what i'm i do it needs to have something that lives outside the photo for it to really feel like a work of art and you know i, I wouldn't say i'm always successful at it you know um but that's the goal and the hope good questions though Vaporwave asks, is there anything you can't paint or don't enjoy to paint? There's a lot of things I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't paint a skydiver from life. <laughs> no. <laughs> you probably could. I mean, if you want, you can give it a shot. <laughs> you know. Uh, is there anything I can't paint? No, you're too talented. You can paint anything. Mm. Uh, who's paying you to say that? <laughs> you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, you know, right now I feel like I can't paint Brittany. No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not because of you, because of me. Some days you're on, some days you're off. No, I'm done, just joking. Just wanted to get her to smile. I'll tell you what I've struggled painting recently. Myself. No Self-portraits are so hard. Self-portraits are hard. Yeah, I feel like so the, I'll skip. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> no, I, I feel like that you, the more paintings you do, the more things you realize what you don't like to paint and what's really hard to paint. The thing is, you always forget that the next time you go to start a painting, mm -hmm. and then you're like, oh crap, that's the thing I don't, don't like, like to paint. <laughs> like to paint. <laughs> Just like when I, every time I paint someone who's mostly in shadow, I'm like, never do that again. And then <laughs> when I'm setting up a model, I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing ever and she's completely in shadow and yeah so yeah it's hard people in complete shadow is very hard but I still do it anyway it's a great example <laughs> I think that Sometimes it's like given enough time you can paint most most things that you can see, but um, I think part of it is can you it's hard you know if you don't have there's some things that take a whole lot of time. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like you know if you, it's it's funny because like at first you feel like you have a quick answer and then you're like <laughs> oh no that's tricky because I can think of a lot of scenarios that that would be that would be tough. Joseph Richardson asks, how do you make a, a drawing with pencil or charcoal feel less work? I'd rather draw with my paintbrush, but any time I try to doodle or draw with charcoal, it stresses me out. But paintbrush equals freedom. <laughs> hmm. Well, I, go ahead. Would What's you say that's a good question? <laughs> no, what is the question? What the question is, is how can I... Well, go ahead and read it again so I don't, like, brutally mess it up. So, how do you make drawing with a pencil and charcoal feel less work? Oh. I'd rather draw with my paintbrush, but any time I try to doodle or draw with charcoal, it stresses me out. But the paintbrush is freedom. Okay. So making it feel less like work? I would say use a, don't use charcoal, use a pencil. Mm. I feel like charcoal is annoying. <laughs> but when I draw with graphite, it feels a lot more free. And you can like hatch over what you've just drawn. And, but with charcoal, it's a big mess. I ironically feel the exact opposite. Sometimes I feel like with Graphite, it's so tight and hard to like push around, but with the charcoal, it, you're right, it's like more messy. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's like paint in that way. Um, yeah. But yeah, I feel like, I don't know, it, maybe it's the, the way you approach it at first. Like maybe using charcoal, starting with like a looser charcoal, like vine charcoal, um, yeah, and like a rag or something right. to move it around, and then getting tighter. I don't know. No, yeah, that is a good point, because if you were using vine or something, that would be one thing. But yeah, when it, whenever I'm using a tight, like, just charcoal pencil, mm -hmm. I'm like, ugh. Yeah. It's like too hard and, yeah. Uh, Gang Gang Deep asks, do you, Alex Venezia, do you feel any pressure to paint females in melancholy or creative poses in an environmental 
in environmental portraits. It seems the art market rewards these types of paintings. Just want to see if you would evolve into any other subject matter that may not be as high in demand. Ooh. That is a good question. Um, first off, I'd say it's it's like, well, that was mainly like a lot of what I was painting. Well, that's still what I'm painting. But definitely like what you're referencing, like my last show and all that. And what I've been painting recently, I've been trying to incorporate some different stuff, but also it happens to be what I really like to paint. And it has nothing to do with the art market. So it's like if you went through my saved like Instagram post, it's a bunch of like melancholy images. Hey, can, you, can you turn just a little bit? Make sure you're aligned with everything. I just want to see. Make sure you're aligned with all. Does that look right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have less of less of a draw, tilt, less I'm of a just, tilt. I'm just going with it. Okay. I think that's my fault. Um, and then the like the melancholy thing. I mean, that just goes to like what type of music I'm interested in, what type of like films and all that. So it's like if you are. If you are someone who likes really happy stuff, like you would rather go see, you know, uh, the B movie in, or Shrek instead of like, a, I don't know, it's just like some really deep, sad movie, then maybe you wouldn't be drawn to be painting sad girls. And then you would be doing it just because the it sells in the market. But. But yes. Hopefully you'll see in my future work, though, that you'll see some evolution of difference from what I was doing. Because once I do something too many times, it's when I get scared and don't want to do it anymore. So, mm. yeah. So Vaporwave asks, if you had to put the whole process into simple steps on how you paint a portrait painting, what would those steps be? Um, well, I think that there's a lot of approaches. Um, in fact, there's different nights where I try different things. So, so I'll say it depends in the sense that it, it, you know, each person has their particular way of doing it. And there's a lot of roads that lead to Rome. Um, but to answer your, your question on the way I would, um, I typically like, I'm a drawing guy. I like to get my drawing sort of right before I, uh, move on to the portrait. Some people like to, to, you know, get toned down first and that's okay too. I'm, you know, I actually believe that that's a really great way of, of doing a portrait. Um, so. That being said, um, I typically like to get at least the shadow and the light structure down. And then once I do that, then I start working on making, I double check like all of the structural elements of the person and make sure that the form is, looks right or the structural form looks right. And then I'll start working from, uh, I'll make my shadow and then I'll work from the light down to the shadow. So or sometimes from the shadow out into the light. I'll kind of like make a light mark and then like a, a darker mark and then go from there. And I'll answer the question like, first off, the way that we're painting right now is not how I would actually paint a portrait. So mm -hmm. any portrait of mine that you look at and you like, it's not painted like this. Yeah, I'll, I guess that would be right. 
this is an a la prima way that I paint. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, I know when I was going to taking a lot of workshops and stuff, I mean, every workshop's like maximum five days. So no one's like truly showing you the full process. So they have to speed it up. So yeah, I mean, basically I would draw it out first and that can be as loose or tight and accurate as I feel is enough information to start painting. And then there's kind of like this first layer that is quite, that's a bit more sketchy and, and um, yeah, is it break? Yeah, <laughs> let me take a break. But anyway, it would be, it would just be more like sketchy and then there would be a third layer that's kind of more refined and you just keep refining it. Uh, and that would take a few weeks, a couple weeks. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break. Um, and we'll be back. everybody <clears throat> back to it Brittany's doing an awesome job this is the first time you've ever done something like this right Brittany yes. See? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well I always say like the people that like are the people that do it their first time they're Never they're awesome because because it's like their first time so they you know, you get you get a veteran. Sometimes the veterans are like, ah, oh, this is an old hat. I'll, I'll, I know when I can move. And they'll get, you know, and you're like, no, I was working on your eyes. <laughs> so we appreciate all our models. It is a it is a tough job. It, you feel like, oh, you're just standing there still. No, no, it's it, your neck gets stiff over time. It starts hurting. So Madeline just made a comment that flowers can be pretty difficult to paint and I was thinking Kristen you just painted some flowers what were some things you sort of learned? Painting? Yes flowers are very difficult um, obviously there's like a time restraint you're working with um, you know a plant that's dying in front of you um, so I think for somebody like me who's um, still learning I mean we're all learning but I'm still learning some foundational things. It was a pretty good challenge for me to um, paint some flowers. I painted um, some peonies recently and they were kind of just opening up before my eyes. So it's a lot of capturing the light very quickly um, and doing it in a way that is not um, overly dramatic. It's a lot of like compression and just paying attention to values. So yeah, very hard and difficult, but it's worth the challenge. I mean, I've learned so much. I've only done two completed flower paintings and I've learned heaps from both paintings. And I, I know if I were to do another, I'd, you know, it'd be another uh, learning experience. So I wouldn't let that challenge um, stop anybody from giving it a go. I think it's definitely worth it. Well said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Everything in painting has its a separate set of challenges, you know, um, because like plain air painting, you know, you're chasing the light the whole time. You're, you know, you're, you're literally, a, 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 you know, racing against the sun to get whatever it is down that you wanted to get down. And then, you know, then you have like, uh, painting people, you know, we, we're so in tune to like the minutia of what makes a person look like a person that to try to like lock in on that is really, really difficult. And then, you know, painting flowers is like, you've got to think about six different ways light affects a flower, mm -hmm. you know, which is like form and then transparent and transmitted light and translucent and like 
making sure that everything makes sense. And then on top of that, it's fleeting, and so it's moving on you. Um, it's, you know, they all have a, a really tough challenge. I haven't done a landscape yet, so that's next for me. But I can imagine it's just as hard, if not harder, than flowers. Yeah, every time I go out plein air painting, it makes me think I don't know how to paint. <laughs> it's definitely the hardest thing for me. Yeah, it's tough. Vaporwave says, thank you for answering my questions. I've been painting lemons and flowers for around half a year and moving on to portraits is a little daunting. Yeah, man. Totally understand. Yeah, I'll also say on that is, I felt like I was the still life guy for a long time and was afraid I was never going to be a, like seen as a, figurative painter and I recently had a show with all figure paintings in it and um, but while I was doing my like still lifes I was doing also doing paintings of figures just usually they weren't good for a while so you don't really see those <laughs> they're hanging at mom's house <laughs> <laughs> they're on the refrigerator yeah. So Alex, could you comment on the fan brush you're using and how you're able to keep the drawing while using it? No, I'm not. If, if I drew, drew this out very well first, I would be keeping the drawing, but this is not going that well. <laughs> but I've been using fan brushes recently because I can get like a big, broad stroke that kind of blends into whatever I'm painting into, like just paint uh, blends right into it with the brush stroke. But then you can use the side of the brush and just get a super sharp line so you can be very kind of careful and messy at the same time or whenever you want. So. And it's some cheap, cheapo brush. That's why it's got duct tape on it. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with cheapo brushes. You can play around with them and feel like you have the liberty to. So there's something that's really helpful about them. Angelo says, Lewis, I enjoyed your plein air painting video. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad you did. Um, I really love doing it. I tell you, I, I, the one, one thing I need to do more of that I haven't done as of late that I just really caught the bug for a while is painting seascapes. Painting seascapes. There's something um, so tranquil about getting out and listening to the shore. And waves are, you know... So they can be so complex. You know, once you start understanding, it's just like an like anatomy of a human. Once you understand the anatomy really well, then the complexity is okay because you understand it. And once you understand a wave and the complexity, it's great. But um, yet again, another very challenging, very daunting thing. It, 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 it's every two seconds it changes on you, and you you have to kind of like develop a memory for it of what you're seeing. Um, but 
Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I, I really loved making it. Um, hoping to do a little bit more content on our uh, subscription platform that is wave-based and seascape-based. So uh, stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll make it happen sometime in the near future. So Bruce says, couple part questions. I've recently been watching a lot of Bog Marta, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, restoration on YouTube, learning a lot about what goes into restoration of old works of art. There was an episode where he needed to adhere a painting to a new substrate and decided to pass on aluminium as his backing due to how much aluminium sweats in temperature changes. I've been painting on aluminum for a while now and had not considered this. Has anyone here had any experience with this if you paint on aluminum? I know East Oaks had done a video on prepping aluminum. Any thoughts as to its lasting ability? Well that is it's a great question. Um, so could you repeat the uh, the sweat the part where he said it was sweating? Is he saying that they weren't using it in its rest in a restorative manner because of its due to temperature change, its forming sweat or sweating like condensation? Yeah, it just says um, due to how much aluminum sweats in temperature changes. Mm. Well, uh, a couple of things with that. It, it, one, I think that it matters, like as a conservator, if you're mounting something to, uh, that was like linen, because nobody painted in aluminum back in the day, um, and how uh, there's like microclimates that can happen, because everything, the, the biggest uh, problem with, with uh, paintings is the variation of humidity that happens in a day and so one of the things that um, that people are trying to figure out how to keep at bay is how do we have because basically when when humidity hits fluctuation of the paints you know expand and contract and all the paints because they're different chemicals and molecules some are organic some are inorganic some are synthetic some are, are uh, natural and um, some are mineral and some aren't. And so it, it's, they all kind of fluctuate at different um, expansions and contractions at different ranges and rates uh, due to humidity and how it reacts to humidity. So the reason, and yes, I do, I paint mainly on aluminum and I adhere my ground straight to it, but because the ground is on it, it's sealed and creates the minimal amount of microclimate, which is what I think that you're talking about, is when the humidity within a microclimate and it's um, how it uh, forms condensation underneath it. So what I would say as far as conservative, if you listen to George O'Hanlon at all or follow any of his teachings, the guy is just a mastermind at chemistry and works directly with con conservators. And he believes that aluminum up to date is, aside from maybe painting like on marble, which marble has shown to be proven one of the best mediums to paint on because um, it is porous, so it doesn't need like a lot of ground and it doesn't react to humidity. The only problem with it is it is extremely heavy <laughs> so and it's incredibly brittle so if you dropped it it's over you know mm -hmm. and um, that's where aluminum comes in because it's like one of the second best things due to the fact that it's not if you drop it it, it has resilience to it and on top of that it's um, it is um, it doesn't effect or, or expand and contract due to humidity. So um, that's why, but it, it shouldn't condensate if it's sealed. That was a really long answer <laughs> to a question, but hopefully that makes sense to you. But 
send us the link to the conservator. I've, list, I've watched a few conservators online. Um, some people are traditionalists and want to adhere to as close to the tradition of what the artist created as possible. And so that's another thing to, to consider. Mustafa Mahmoud says, thank you for releasing the new platform of East Oak Studio. Many great workshops with very affordable prices, like having a table with so many yummy dishes, hard to choose which one to start with. <laughs> Mustafa, <laughs> buddy, I hadn't heard from you in a while. I hope you are well, uh, especially in all these crazy times. Thank you so much for always following us and always giving us a shout out, buddy. Um, we, uh, we are honored that you love it so much. We, we, we make it for people like you. So, um, so thank you. And every day we're working hard to make it better and better in every way we can. So uh, stay tuned as we continue to learn what people want and need. Um, so, but thank you for being such a participant and, and such an ambassador for us. So everyone, if you don't know, I, I will go ahead and throw it out there. We have a new subscription platform. You can still purchase any of our single videos, but we have just released uh, an interface that allows for you to play with, uh, to watch the videos, just like you would watch Netflix on your iPad, on your phone, on your, on your laptop computer, on your desktop. And um, it's, it's a very fair price that gives you access to all the videos um, that we have produced. And we're continuing to produce them. And not too long from now, we're going to continue. There's gonna, we're going to add new tiers to it and new services that people can have um, that will hopefully help their painting journey. The, hope, the whole hope is that we want to help contribute to your painting journey in any way we can. And uh, so we're going to try to like make a lot of even beginner uh, content and even have some live counseling and critiques on there soon. So stay tuned. All right, well, I think I got the, the drawing enough to at least start painting. Otherwise, I'm never going to get some actual paint on here. So Madeline says, sometimes my flowers come out kind of abstract, but I press on and hope to get a more realistic portrayal. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I know that Michael, when he starts his flower paintings, um, they are quite abstract. Yeah. They are just very big orbs of color. And then he builds on those, and he keeps building and building and building and building onto them. So um, it's not a hard, a, a bad place to start. Um, if you haven't ever watched one of his videos, I, I think he does a really great job of showing sort of a step-by-step -step building process um, for someone to understand and the, who, who's starting out. Um, but, you know, it, it's the, the thing that I would say is one of the best things I can, advice I can give, if the flowers the flowers end up having an overall shape, and the overall shape typically is like kind of a, for, a sphere form. And so first think of it as a sphere and how it, it reacts with light, um, like a sphere would. And then make your lightest area that's light most facing, um, you know, your brightest spot of the flower, and then turn it away and make it just like this very, a uh, thin orb of color. And then once you've done that, then start building sort of petals that, that correlate to that spherical nature. Um, so even though the petals and everything, there's lots of space in between them, 
the overall feeling will still make it feel like it's this volume in space. Uh, Vicky says, Lewis, what kind of surface and ground do you find works best for plein air painting? I often find I can't get as much coverage as I would like because the paint keeps sliding around. Ooh, good question. Um, well, what I have used in the past is um, Raymar. In fact, this is a Raymar panel that I'm working on right now. Raymar panels, and this isn't a plug, but I do believe they make really great pot products for plein air painters. Um, you know, they have like gator foam ones and things that make are pretty light. But I believe that the, the canvas that I use is a Clausen's 13 um, linen. And it's a fine linen. I think it's uh, quadruple primed or triple primed. So it's a portrait linen, but I actually think it works pretty well for plein air painting. Um, so as far as like the sliding effect, uh, it, it really depends on how loose, you know, your, your, or how watery you've made your paint. So I'm not sure what's making it slide because if you build, if you build on top of like very thin, like, uh, diluted and try to put thick, it might, it might end up having like, uh, it, not adhering well effect to, to your paint, um, to the, to the surface. Alex, do you have um, any recommendations there? Mm. I, think. Well, I mean, definitely a linen would help it not slide around as much, but you made a good point that if you're probably, if you're putting like a super soupy, like, like if you're drawing or like the base that you're putting down is just like super terpy and like wet, I could definitely see it all sliding around. But, so I've used linen, but then I've also used like a board like this and how I paint, like paint a la prima, it, it seems to not slip around like that, so. Soft brushes. Mm. Soft brushes are linen, I would say. All right, is that break? Yeah, mm -hmm. All right. All right, back to it. So we have a question from Walt. Walt. How do you photograph your works professionally? Do you pay someone or is it done yourselves? That's a great question, Walt. Believe it or not, I'm actually going to be doing a video not too long from now on that exact topic. Um, I photograph my work. Uh, I know a lot of people that use a professional in town. Uh, not in our town, but like in whatever town that they're on. There always is a professional photographer who does that kind of uh, work uh, that will be pretty much local. Um, what I tend to do is I light, light it with the same lighting that I used to paint with, which is also the lighting that we're, we're working under right now. And um, I tend to, um, basically I try to get a sort of a middle aperture on my camera I make sure that my ISO is down to 100. And you can look all of these things up if you don't know what I'm talking about. But, my aperture I try to put on about a desktop of eight, six to eight, and then I put my ISO on about a hundred. And then I try to make, it doesn't matter what the shutter speed is as long as I have it on a tripod. And then I shoot in RAW, which is a, a uh, file format that you can, uh, allows for just more data to, to be captured. With those three things, I tend to like shoot in the same direction as my light source. So like, I, in other words, I wouldn't have my light to the right of me and then shoot 
to the left because then it'll create glare. So if I'm shooting the, the, the painting from the left, then my light source needs to be from the left and I'll be kind of underneath it. Um, I tend to, now that you can like warp the image into a square on like, on like Photoshop and things like that, I, I go in and I straighten the image after shooting it offset. And that's just because it reduces the glare almost as minimal as it can be. Once I've done that, then I, um, I sort of color correct it on Photoshop and that's a whole nother tutorial. And uh, then we're home free. That's kind of my process. Yeah, I photograph my own work, but <clears throat> if I knew that there was a really good photographer in town that could shoot oil paintings, I think I'd pay him. Every time I try and take a photo, I'm just like, this could be so much better. And it's such a hassle mm -hmm. for me. And then I'm looking at other people's paintings that just have really good quality photos. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. If, it would, if I could find someone that made it look as like super close to what it actually looks like in real life, I'd give him some money. There you go. Because, Donia yeah. says, hello everyone. I would like to ask you for some advice to draw from life. I am stuck on exercises that are based on photography. Well, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that I'll, I'll say that there's, there's the long answer is, you know, there's a lot of academic training of, to teach you on just that kind of thing. Um, but if I were to give you a short answer, there are tools of investigating that are both two, first and foremost two-dimensional and then secondary three-dimensional that you can use in order to find out what proportions you're looking at. Um, so like some of the examples that I like to give are comparative measurement, which is finding a half and using the measure of the height to the width of, of your uh, portrait. Um, then you can use tilts, which is using like tilt angles of your model that you have and in trying to use those to uh, investigate in comparison to where like the eyes might be versus the, the lips and, and so on and so forth. Um, then there is uh, shapes and understand, understanding the proportion of shapes. This is points, tilts and shapes are what I would call two-dimensional investigative tools and comparative measurement as well. And then there's um, three-dimensional comparative tools, which is understanding how planes interact with each other three-dimensionally and trying to imagine them in space. Um, my best suggestion is to find either, if you're remote and you can't afford to go to like an atelier or something like that, you can, there's plenty of resources and East Oaks being one of them, even on our free content, uh, I believe Josh LaRock gives a few demonstrations of, of this on our uh, site. But um, there's, there's people who will train and teach you in just this, this manner. So um, I would suggest that that would be the first place to start. And that would be just the drawing. I'm not even talking about like color application and painting. Um, and that's a whole nother ball of wax, but um, hopefully that'll help you at least make the first step on your journey. Alex, do you have anything to add or offer? No, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. It's like, you just kind of have to find one video or take one workshop that shows you like kind of how to start measuring from life. And then you can just, yeah, use that on anything. Cause that's like all I know. So it's what you can, like what I use on photos as well. 
but yeah I could imagine though that work there is some like drawing methods that are very exclusive to photographs I haven't thought of that before mm. Question for Lewis. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like your most beneficial year was at Grand Central when you were training? You know what? I think it was my first year because it was concepts that I'd never heard before. Um, in order to like what they were doing was they're literally trying to create like what I, I call like brain hacks, which is like this idea of just like hacking different size and giving you analogies for you to be able to discover another way of seeing and um and really the foundation of like realism is understanding value and how to manipulate value and what i would say for me um what they taught at grand central is 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 form modeling and how to understand how to use a an illusion that happens with your eye called simultaneous contrast uh, and then turn it on its end for you to use to your advantage as an illusion for other people and that was just like groundbreaking I just had never heard of anything like that before but I knew that they were doing something that I didn't know how to do. And I knew that if I at least tried, I could at least get to figure out, I could figure out how, what it was as long as I like went somewhere that was teaching it. You know, it's kind of like, I know I could do that. I just don't know how. And so I feel like that's the, that was the thing that I needed to learn how to do. And, uh, it revolutionized my understanding. Um, so, but year two, I, I most certainly honed in on skills that I'd never had before uh, in, in figure drawing and painting, and that was very helpful too. But it teaches you a form of academic style that you then have to break uh, a little bit in order for you to be able to find a unique voice. And sometimes that can be the detriment of artists if they can't find a way to break through um, that and create their own identity, you know, uh, then your work, because all your work starts looking the same otherwise. That's a good question. I've never been asked that one before. So I'm sure there's a lot of people from all over the place and I'm sure y'all have been saying hi what are some of the people where are some of the people and um so we can say hi back on says hi and good morning from sweden at 1 a.m hi on wow nice. hey. i'm so glad that you're a possible insomniac because then <laughs> you are able to join us so that's a silver lining i hope I hope that it's just that you're a night owl, but we appreciate you joining us. Always Dennis. wanted to go to Sweden. Dennis says, good evening from the UK. Dennis? Hey. What part of the UK is uh, Dennis from? Text us back and let us know what part of the UK you're from. So Vaporwave says, Alex, you may not remember me, but you gave me some advice on Instagram and pointed me towards a book by Solomon. This helped mm -hmm. me a lot in the beginning, so just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I totally remember the name. At first, when you first asked the question from Vaporwave, I was like, Vaporwave? Because <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this, but it's a certain genre of music. Oh. That's like, it's like old school music mixed with like electronic, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like super chill music. 
Oh, that's awesome. What <laughs> kind of old school are you talking about? I mean, yeah, you, to, that's kind of a broad... Like, uh, like 20s or 50s? Let me get back to you on this. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. On break, we're going to look it up and figure it out. We, I had a friend na named David, and he really liked Vaporwave, so we called him Vapor Dave. Vapor Dave. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I wish we could play that, like, uh, types of music on YouTube, but YouTube does not allow it, and one time we... Had like classical music playing in the background, and uh, they took our our um, video down. I was like, "Oh man, could have just warned us and yeah. let us keep it up one time." But I guess if they did that, then <laughs> that would be they had to do that for everybody, and that would be a bad day. Question for Lewis. Did you start with site size method in, in Grand Central Atelier? No. Uh, in fact, it's funny because I always say that, that ateliers, just like most anything in life, are, are quite tribal. And they, you know, part of like creating a brand is to create an identity. And so you have to like find ways of saying, this is not our identity and this is. And one of the things that they would adamantly be against is site size because that was not part of their identity. That was sort of like a Florence Academy identity. That was like one of their main things that they liked to teach. And so, uh, and so they would always talk about the limitations. It most certainly has advantages in situations and they would hint at it, their advantages in our, in our program, but they um, most certainly, it was comparative measurement was the main source of investigation and then anything you did on, on top of that, like tilts and points and shapes and that kind of thing was like secondary um, to, to that. So uh, great question though. Um, I, saying all of that, there are times where I feel like site size has advantages, but it is a limited tool of investigation if you um, if you're not careful, it can, it can, uh, prevent you from feeling versatile because there's only certain situations that it actually applies. And then like, it'll make you fearful of wanting to get out to try other, other poses. Like side size doesn't work really well in like a reclining pose or someone who is very foreshortened in their, in their approach. So like if someone's modeling and their feet are coming towards you and um, you know only their torso and they're sitting but their feet are coming at you, side size doesn't really work as well in that manner. It can, but it's limited. So, um, so that's why I say, you know, throw that in sort of the, as an arrow in your quiver of investigation, but make sure that that's not the only one you have in there. I tell people a lot, this, this is going to bring up, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second here, but I tell people a lot that there, there are a lot of different tools out there to get you to where you need to go. And if you did some of them perfectly, they would perfectly get you to that spot that you need to be. So if you're perfectly good at understanding form on a person, then you wouldn't need to know anatomy or if you're perfectly good at understanding shapes of shadows and plane changes, then you wouldn't need to know anatomy. But anatomy can actually help you investigate where the shortcomings of those other tools of investigation and look like your shortcomings of knowing how to do it perfectly. And so it just gives you a better chance at success in knowing a lot of different forms and trying to master a lot of different forms. Dunia has a question for Alex. Mm -hmm. What colors do you use most um, in your paintings, specifically painting nature, uh, green things and foliage? Oh, God. 
Green is my worst enemy. <laughs> um, but I've been getting better at it because it's been giving me a very hard time. Because I've been doing a series of works with figures outside. And um, so I've, because of that, I've literally almost every painting, painting like changed the like yellows and greens I've used. So um, what would be the, I mean, definitely having like a yellow ochre and a high chroma yellow, because just having a high chroma yellow like a cad can make everything look to lime green, which if you've seen any, if you've seen a recent painting, you could see that it possibly <laughs> went a little too lime green. Um, but let me think. I mean, some like nature colors that, because I use the same palette for everything that I paint, except for if I'm painting nature with green, I'll add like a high chroma yellow like a cad yellow and then that's really the only difference but I definitely would have yellow ochre, transparent oxide red, um, like raw umber, ultramarine blue, um, like burn umber, black, just kind of a lot of those earthy, earthy colors and then those with your, with your yellows. But yeah. It's all pretty much the same palette. So, on the same vein, what colors are must-haves for skin tones, Vaporwave asks. I would say, um, I would say prob, oh, it's really hard because must-have because for the longest time I didn't ever use yellow ochre and I only had like a lemon yellow and I was able to make skin tone and now I use yellow ochre. But my like must haves at the moment is basically like yellow ochre. Um, I've been, I used to have alizarin crimson and like a cad red on my palette but I got rid of both of them and replaced it with something that's kind of in the middle, which is Chinese Vermilion by uh, Sennelier, which is the red that Odd Nerdrum uses. And it's kind of like this nice in-between, basically because I'm just trying to limit my palette more. So it's like that yellow, that red, and then transparent oxide red I'm constantly using to get rich shadows and, and stuff like that, and in like rich darks. And then to make rich darks, I'm also using that with the ultramarine blue. So I mean, if I had transparent oxide red, ultramarine blue, my red and my, my yellow ochre and white, I would be good to paint skin. So Ghana Deep asked, how does the ego limit the artist and can the ego be used as part of the social identity of the brand? That's such a good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. So far, I think you win the award. Uh, interesting question for the night. Well, I want to start with the last part of that question. Anything can be a part of your brand. You just have to know that it is. And um, so let me go ahead and we're, we're taking a break. So I'm going to just like stop for a second and, you know, you, you can keep going. But, uh. no, uh, so while, can take a, you can take a break. while she's you taking a break, stop. I'll answer that question and then we'll go on mute for a little bit. But any, anything that you want can be a part of your brand. You've just got to know that it is and then lean into it to be a part of your brand. But you also got to understand what the consequences of whatever that thing is as it being a part of your brand. So if you want ego to be a part of your brand, just realize what that means and what the consequences of that action are going to do. 
So obviously, you know, ego can like, you can, you end up being a bit more polarizing, so your audience gets smaller. But if you have a particular audience you're going for, then that's then that's okay. Um, I I think that there's a lot of things that you can create your brand to be very creative, and so I believe ego is used too much in our our society today to be a part of their brand, and I think that it is a bit of white noise in my opinion. Um, you can use it and it'll work for you, but I, that's just my own personal thoughts there. There are so many things that you can use to be creative and sometimes I think that people who kind of go with the main vein, uh, it's a cop out. If it's truly a part of who you are, then that's just a part of your brand and there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and I know some people that are like that as well. I personally believe that at the end of the day, an ego can be detrimental because it can put, it can set you up on a pedestal for you to be knocked down. So that's another uh, thing that I think it has sort of a shortcoming for. Um, what was the beginning part of that question? Can ego be used as part of the social identity of the brand? And that was, there was a beginning of that question, wasn't there? Or was that the whole that question? That was it. Okay. Um, yes, it will most certainly can. Um, but I believe that there are a lot of better ways to create a, uh, a stronger brand with a greater audience um, if audience is something that you're interested in. So, um, but that is a fantastic question. I love that question. And we're going to take a break and we'll be back. All right, back again. Just put in a little bit of Allison asks, what is the warm color that we usually see under your shadows? I think this effect is beautiful. Under my shadows. Hmm. Well, it's probably transparent oxide red and ultramarine blue mixed together. So it's like, I don't know how well you can see it, but because this hair is like scumbled in, there's a bit of glowiness kind of like coming through and that's transparent oxide red and ultramarine blue. And if it's not that, then it's just like the raw umber from like toning the canvas, but it's probably the transparent oxide red and ultramarine. The boss asks, what exercises do you recommend to understand volume? Well, uh, the, there's, there's a couple exercises on some of our free YouTube videos on when you see like a sphere. Um, so Michael does one and Josh Larock does one on how to draw a sphere, form on a sphere. And I would say, even though it sounds like lame and like simple, um, it's the best way to start understanding volume. Um, but uh, it ba the most basic form is to understand where your light most facing plane is coming from, which basically means what plane is the most perpendicular to the light because that plane is going to have the most photons bouncing off of it in, into your eye. And since it has the most photons bouncing off of it into your eye, it's going to be the brightest spot minus maybe the reflection, which is a different form of light emission from your sphere. So 
because of you understanding that every facet on say you think of this ball as a disco ball or the sphere as a disco ball every little facet is a plane every little mirror piece is a plane and so any plane that's less than perpendicular to the light is going to get slightly darker than the one next to it and so as you go towards where there's no more light hitting it you're approaching what they call the terminator line which is the line at which light is passing by and not hitting the surface and it gets exponentially darker as you get to that line so the best way to understand how to draw things in space is to understand how light works so that would be that would be my best answer i can give without spending you know the rest of the time talking about it but um, check out Michael Klein's uh, video on conceptualizing a sphere. It's, it's free on YouTube. And then uh, Josh LaRock has one on drawing the sphere. Um, and both of those do a good job of explaining how to conceptualize um, form in space and volume. Uh, vaporwave quails asks, what are you thinking about when you're painting and what's your favorite takeaway? Takeaway. <laughs> what? <laughs> we don't call it takeaway in America. Oh, well, yeah, what are your, what, well, then we call it that in Australia. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta take out it. Take out. Yeah, sorry, what are you thinking about when you're painting? And what's your favorite takeout? Wait, is that actually the question? <laughs> That's actually the question. With a crying, laughing face after the takeout. Question. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> you thought that was Divya trying to yeah, play a, play a joke. It must be European. Or wherever they say takeaway. So what do you think about when you're kind. painting? And what is your favorite takeout food? And this is definitely a question from another person. Um, <laughs> definitely a question from another person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as in it's not you. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this whole scenario is hilarious. Uh, sorry, here's the beginning. Well, I'll answer the non-art one. <laughs> there you go. What's your favorite takeout? I love Thai food. Love it. <laughs> That's awesome. I am a big Thai food fan, too. What food would you recommend not to have when you're painting? Not to have? <laughs> Anything you can hold in your hands, especially if you're painting with lead white. Soup. Finger food. <laughs> yeah, soup would be hard to paint with. <laughs> Is this... Is this someone else's question? Well, I was going off what he was saying okay. with the takeout. <laughs> takeout. Hmm. Well, everyone here really enjoys a good smoothie. Yes. Yeah. Everyone does enjoy a good smoothie here. I'm thinking about what is my favorite takeout food. <laughs> That's what he's thinking about when he paints. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to eat. Yeah. I will say that actually enters my mind quite <laughs> yeah. a bit when I'm painting. <laughs> especially, yeah, like, especially if I'm really wanting to be distracted. And I, and I want to, like, uh, procrastinate. I'm like, hmm, have I eaten yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that was five minutes ago. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, eating's like my little reward. I'll be like, okay, you have to finish this section and then you can eat. I'll see. <laughs> so I'm always thinking about it. So you, literally the carrot at the end of the stick for you. Mm-hmm. To keep you going. But I guess realistically, what, are, what am I thinking about? Putting the right color in the right spot. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that means the right color means the right value and chroma. So you're like compare, always comparing everything to everything else. And then putting in the right spot means drawing. So it's like every single one of those things all at once. And it's really hard. Yep. That's why I don't know what to do. Question for Alex. Mm-hmm. Where did you study painting? I took workshops. I, so I'm like mostly self-taught, but it's a, a weird thing to say self-taught because it's not like I sat alone in my room and didn't let anybody else's like thoughts or teachings enter my mind. But I tried to take as many workshops as I could which, I mean, in total is definitely less than 10. Um, and then just, and then books, like uh, Vaporwave mentioned the Solomon J. Solomon book, and certain, like, painting DVDs were, like, really important to me that I watched a lot. Um, and just constant, like, practice and trying to like do what I learned at the workshops and just constantly making my own paintings. Um, yeah, so it was kind of no specific school, just a lot of a lot of teachings condensed into short periods of times in workshops. And stuff. Mm. Yep. Which has its pros and cons. A question for Louie. Hmm. Do you consider making a workshop for absolute beginners at East Oak Studios next programs? Uh, Ask Mustafa. Absolutely. We are most certainly working on um, a couple of different things uh, with that. But yes, we're, we're, we're working on doing some beginner stuff so that uh, our curriculum material so that um, because I feel like that's one thing that East Oaks, we've done a lot of incredible workshops in, that are very informative of how really known painters paint. But one of the things that I feel that there's a lot of artists that need is, is um, the very foundational beginning. And, um, and so I want to make sure that we are giving that as an opportunity for people who want to learn uh, from the beginning. So, um, yes, that is our hope and dream is to get as much content that is for, uh, the very beginning of an artist's journey that can take them up to the workshop stage and then they can take the workshops, um, that we've already offered. But, um, great question. And that is to come this year. Vaporwave said, I thought I would ask a non-artsy-fartsy question <laughs> in regards to the take-out question. And he said, good to know. Anytime you want to order us takeout, we'll take it, no matter what it is. <laughs> My favorite, I mean, I, I can never pass down a good pizza. Just to, just throwing that out there. I love a good pizza. I, I mean, I lived in Italy for a little over a year and, you know, um, I fell in love with their culture and their culture is you either eat pizza and pasta at least once a day. <laughs> so, you know, 
there's a little bit of me that was like, you are what you eat too. So I kind of looked like a piece of pizza and pasta at the end of it. But boy, I was a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it was amazing. <laughs> I'm imagining you as a piece of pizza. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> <laughs> Looked a bit like a calzone. <laughs> yeah, my takeout has changed over these past few years now because I have a wife that's vegan so it used to be like Chinese food and tacos and stuff like that and now we get healthy stuff and it's wonderful honey <laughs> and I hate it <laughs> save me <laughs> No, I, I, uh, I definitely feel a lot better eating more plant-based. Um, Alex Ken says, it looks great, man. Your friend Ken. Thanks, Ken. Woo! <laughs> Me and Ken used to do this in his garage. Oh, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. It's good to have great buddies. Um, Maggie says uh, that she's has she's had teachers that use fan brushes, and mm. do you think it's good to use them? Like, what's your opinion overall? Oh well, <laughs> Alex, I take it away. <laughs> I hate fan brushes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I've learned to really like them, but I feel like that's because I watched someone use one really well because I feel like there's totally a way to use this thing like Bob Rossi that just looks really kind of tacky and bad but I watched uh, Jeff Hine uses a fan brush a lot and then um, this painter from Russia Nikolai Blockin something like that I, I have one of his videos and he just like does some awesome stuff with a fan brush. So that's what got me into it, but they definitely use it in a certain way. It's not just a bunch of, you know, fan brushy wisps everywhere. I'm about to bust mine out. Yeah, man. Join the club. So Vaporwave says, how are you with painting animals? And if I ever do a tattoo convention in the US, the pizza is on me. Hey, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I have a big respect for tattoo artists out there. There's some really phenomenal tattoo artists. So, uh, Wave, you already don't do it. You should follow David Gluck because he is a classically trained guy from Florence Academy that is now a tattoo artist, both he and his wife. Um, uh, Katie, Kate Stone? Mm -hmm. Kate Stone. Um, are great people and they, they are into the tattooing world. Also, I think a lot of people that Sean, follow Sean Cheatham uh, that are tattoo artists. So, pretty awesome. Allison says, I see many artists often starting with a general mass and building the shadows on that still wet base. How do you go about building shadows that way without getting them dirty? Hmm. Um, to think. It, I think it has to do with one, like the quality of your paint and two, the the way that you're laying the paint on. So like this brush is super soft and wispy, so I can kind of just lay a nice piece of paint right on top of a fully wet piece of paint and it's gonna kind of just stay there and it's not gonna muddy it up and it's not gonna scratch it away or anything like that. So like a really soft brush and good quality paint because I just know that I, when, I've, when I have taught, 
in person. Um, trying to paint on people's paintings with bad quality paint, it just always ends up kind of going to chalky or muddy. Mm. Like no matter what I did, unless I use like the pure pigment. And so I think there's more to say like about that than people realize. Mm. But I'm sure I'm probably doing something that like I'm subconsciously not aware of. Question for Alex, asked Boris. What would you say is the most important thing or things you learned from Odd Nerdrum? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. Well, there was some technical things um, that I I don't know how important they were, and I don't use I don't always use them, but there was some stuff that he was doing with scraping and sandpaper that basically answered a lot of questions of, that I had about his technique when I used to look at his paintings and be like, how the hell did you do that? Like it just looked completely like just something you couldn't do with a brush. It didn't make any sense to me. And just seeing this process of constantly kind of scraping and sanding it down and painting on top of that and that kind of thing was I think very important to see because it's something I want to incorporate in my work and will do later when I start painting on like linen and stuff more and making my own linen because it can't have lead in it and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, you know, it's a lot of stuff about just kind of telling a story with painting. He's very much about like a painting is kind of related to almost a movie and it has to have like a beginning, a middle and an end to the story within one painting. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. But I guess now that I'm actually thinking about it, the most important thing that I saw was him take a basically a doodle sketch, like nothing fantastic and turn that into a huge multi-figure like life-size painting and like all the steps it took to go about that like all like him picking out props setting up the model you know I did you just like you just don't have any idea how someone goes about something like that so to see it happen in front of you in front of you was amazing it's a good answer so junior asks what do you deal, what do you, oh, I can ask the question on the next break. Okay. The question before was from Junior. What do you do to deal with the frustrating, with the frustration of feeling like you are not learning? Ooh, good question. <laughs> That's like a. I feel like Go that Kristen. question. <laughs> that question like spoke to my soul. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I think you and Divya would be excellent participants in that. Yeah. Or, yeah, anyone can take that question because all of us have been there. Well, there's two parts that I can answer that with. One being, I just make sure to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> um, but usually at the end of it, even with my questions, it feels like I'm not getting it or I'm not learning or I'm not making any progress. I've told everyone hear this, that the biggest lesson I've learned here is to just keep painting. Um, because a lot of the times it's, you know, you just, you can't know it until you, you know, 
just keep working through it and experiencing it on the canvas itself um, because you can have all the head knowledge in the world but really the rubber meets the road you know when you're painting so for me whenever I feel like I'm not learning I just have to kind of trust the process and um, you know <laughs> Lewis always says fail forward so knowing that like each painting isn't um, even though I see it as a failure in my eyes it's teaching me something and and you know I'm with each painting I create I'm learning even if it doesn't feel like it um, mm. so it's yeah it's a lot of like pushing through that negative self-talk and um, yeah Divi and I talk a lot about that um, you know we come to these moments where we're like what am I doing you know like am I even making any progress and you can just kind of go down that spiral of negative thinking but um, at the end of the day, I really just, I think the answer is just, you know, all right, get back to the easel now. <laughs> You've had your moment and keep painting. Um, but yeah, beyond that, just asking questions and getting specific about the things that I'm struggling through, like really trying to critically think about what, where the struggle lies rather than just count the whole painting as a failure. Um, so yeah, for me recently, it's been a lot of like color and um, you know, trying to compress values. Whereas I know my like drawing skills, I feel like I'm at a point where that comes a little bit more naturally to me. So getting more specific about where I need help and then asking those specific questions, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. That's awesome. Great answer. It's hard to hard to tell that you're learning sometimes it's such a like slow gradual process mm. for painting you know I, I had a mentor who would I'd sit down and I'd watch him paint he was I would call him a role model uh, but because he, he would like scold me for calling him a mentor <laughs> but uh, I had a role model guy who he would always say, now, Lewis, watching a person paint is like watching a snail run a mile. And I used to love that, but I think that that's applicable to how long it takes to see you transition in your learning. You know, it's just learning is such a slow process. So this is just dovetailing off of what Alex is saying, but um, that... It, it comes with frustration. So, and if you're not frustrated, you're not doing it right. Like you're, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you, it's baked into it and failure mm -hmm. is baked into success. So like, I was telling this to, I think both Kristen and Divya recently, which is, um, you know, a rocket, in rocket science, they, they learn about 20 times more about a rocket when it fails than when it actually succeeds because they don't know where it almost failed mm -hmm. when it succeeds. But they know all the places that it did fail when it does. So they know how to like, they can actually pivot a lot faster. And so I love to use that analogy a lot when in the painting world, because if you have failed and you realize that you have, then just ask yourself and keep asking yourself, what am I needing to learn from this? Yeah, that's good. I feel like social media too, and just like the world we live in, comparison can kind of mm -hmm. make you feel like you're farther behind than you are. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we're seeing all these emerging artists coming forth because of like you know Instagram and um, Facebook and things like that and it can easily feel like you're behind the curve um, but yeah I think Ed Jonas once said or he quoted somebody that once said um, that painting is an old man's profession and a young man's sport in the sense that like it you never really master it until you know you're in your elder age really if you do so you know our whole youth until probably past it's going to be 
a struggle and learning and failing forward in that way. So yeah, comparison, I'd say is like another key to stopping that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. And just adding, I think there was like, uh, there's a book that um, me and Alex are reading called Mastery. Um, and there was like a part about this topic and how if you're frustrated, your brain kind of shuts off from learning. Like you need to sort of activate the more open part. Well, as in coming to like learning a new, frustration is normal, but um, just start. Basically don't paint when you're too frustrated or I don't know, Alex, you can explain it better than me. Um, well, yeah, because that, but there was also parts saying that, like, how when something is really frustrating and you feel like literally there's no way you can understand it, there's no way you can get it, that's like your, like, frontal cortex literally understanding it. And then eventually when it starts to feel like second nature, it is when it goes like to the back of your brain and it's more of like something that you've learned and processed. But yeah, what you're talking about is kind of like, yeah, if you're too stressed out about how much you feel like you like suck at the moment and you can't kind of zen yourself out of it and be like, this is just a painting, like I'm just learning, you know, don't beat yourself up if you're beating yourself up, your brain's going to kind of just shut down and you're not going to be able to do it mm -hmm. anyway. So that I feel like is more of like when you're really frustrated, take a break because you're just going to paint worse. Mm. If you keep going at it. Yeah, it's good. What advice would you give to someone who is about to start an atelier? Ooh. <laughs> um, I would say that there's, there's a couple of things I would say. One, one is, and they're going to sound kind of counter to each other, but one of them is, is that take everything you know about painting so far and don't let your ego get in the way and set it aside and be open to learn as much as you possibly can about everything you don't know. Once, and there's going to be times where you're going to be like, I can't see, They're going to, you're going to have an instructor come over and be like, you need to fix this thing because of this, 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 and this. And you're going to be like, I can't see it, and I don't know if I trust him. Uh, I've not only been there myself, I've seen other people do this. And then they have another teacher, totally unrelated to that instructor, come over and say, you need to fix this thing for this, this, this and reason. And it's the same critique. And, and you're like, huh, he, he said the other thing. Did you talk to so-and-so? No, I, I, you just need to fix that because of X, Y, and Z reason. And you're like, oh, and you start to see it a little bit. Then you have like a third person come over and they'll say the exact same critique. And that's when I'm like, okay, I, <laughs> I need to start seeing better, you know. And there's multiple times where that happened. Then there's other times where you'll have one instructor feel like they're giving the, like the opposite advice of, of the uh, instructor before him. And sometimes that's because like somebody will give you advice and you'll take it to the ex nth degree and like the pendulums will swing all the way the other way and then somebody else will come over and be like oh you need to fix that and go the other way again and it'll make it be like well Johnny said you know and you know <laughs> and so just keep in mind that we deal in a world of minutia and when people ask you to change something it typically means it's quite subtle and it's changing but keep an open mind in learning okay now that I said that the second thing is 
don't, if you already have started a voice, don't lose your voice. So always keep trying to figure out ways to incorporate a part of you in painting that you set aside and the academic learning that you learned and how do you make them marry together because part of what I see a lot of people is doing is they just mimic the other people that are at an atelier and then they lose their voice and so um, and I, I feel like you know in some senses that is quite sad you know um, because that, you know, one of the advantages I think that Alex had not going to an atelier, atelier is that he, he didn't lose his voice because he never had to. Um, so you just need to be careful that you're not painting, you don't end up painting like everyone else. It's a stepping stone to get a skill set that you can then manipulate to create poetry. It's like you're going to a school to learn all the vocabulary words in a dictionary now you need to go put them together and create poetry. It's the same idea. So that is what I would say would be the, my advice about going to the atelier. Do you have any, Alex? No, I mean, that's spot on. Know that it's, like you said, lear learning how to write. Yeah. You, it's not like you just keep repeating what you've learned how to write you then have to go write something yeah it, it is a tough thing especially when the the culture of the place might not so not uh, encourage that or it's just not yep. even a thought and you think that once you start kind of once you get your stuff to look like their stuff that you're actually like winning when it's like in reality yeah, you've learned something, but yeah, you gotta do something with it. Basically, I agree. But I, I tell you, my my learning and training that I got at an atelier was invaluable. It it would have taken me probably five more five to ten more years of my own training and learning to do it on my own. And and if I never heard some of the things there, then I probably never would have learned some of them. Um, so I'm. I'm a firm believer in them, but just with everything, you've got to be careful of what is dogma and what is a useful tool in making sure you separate the two. Because um, dogma can be um, preventative in your creative uh, learning if you're not careful. So, that was a great question. I tell you what, we, our, our questions tonight have been on point. I have another one for you. Um, S asks, do, you, do any of you have advice for becoming a full-time artist? I feel like I'm inching my way there, but I haven't gotten to it yet. When did you know you were ready? Ooh. Mm. Well, no, oh, man. There, this one is a fantastic question, uh, but it, it just requires a lot of, um, there's, a, it's, there's a lot of different answers, and it really depends on where you are and what you do. So there's, yet again, there's a lot of roads that lead to Rome in this situation, and so it's like, what is it that's going to get get you to the road that you desire. So there's lots of different types of painters. There are gallery painters. There are commissioned painters that, that mainly deal with commission work. There are um, painters that work that are like gig oriented. There's paint, you know, and so it's like you've got to know first of like, you have a particular field that I don't know. Let's just start there. Um, and so it's hard for me to answer the full question for you because I just don't know what kind of painter you already are. But what I think is a good rule of thumb 
for me is first and foremost what I tell people when I'm giving them business advice is an artist's life is a fluctuating one. So for you to go out full time, rule number one, you've got to be debt free. You, you, if you have $40,000 in student loans, I don't recommend you just going out and being a full-time painter because it might take you forever to, to like get ahead. Now, rule number two is, are you at least as a side gig making 30 to, uh, 30 to 40% of your income from your side gig? Uh, and this is just, I think, good entrepreneurial advice. This is, you know, I, I do a lot in, that, in this field with like business and entrepreneurship. And I think this is just a good rule of thumb for anyone. So, um, so that's another thing um, that I would say is like, where are you on your financial stability? Um, and thirdly is, is how big is your market? And if your market is small, do you know how to reach your audience? So when you are, when you are, um, if you if you're a person that paints blackbirds with ghosts, you got to know that you have an audience that likes paintings of blackbirds and ghosts, and that there's enough of them. There, I mean, there's seven billion people out there. There's enough of them out there. You you got to find them now. So because your audience is very very small, you know. So do you have? Uh, and understanding where that audience is, you know. Um, so this is becoming a long-winded answer because I'm a long-winded guy. So, but hopefully that at least give you some some starting points of when I feel like an artist is is good check marks and litmus tests. Are are you in a in a state at which you can go full time? Now, I'm a conservative guy, too, so I'm not a guy that just all, all of a sudden just leaps from the cliff. I, I'm, I'm a calculated risk guy and always have been. So, uh, so take my, my advice with a grain of salt. Linda says, this video is great because you do not speed up, but show the thoughts and struggles of what you see. I like how you talked about knowing your purpose in what you choose and how you choose to paint. Oh, thank you. You said that was Linda? Yes. Thank you, Linda. Boris says, do you have any advice on starting to come up with your own ideas in painting? I've been doing a lot of copy, master copies and I want to paint my own things, but I feel kind of unsure about it. Mm. Mm. Alex, you got some, some thoughts here, bud? Yeah, I mean, hmm. Well, one, like, to come up with, if, I mean, first off, if you haven't, you have to do a bunch of bad ideas before you, like, get a good one. So it's like, even if you think your idea is bad, you have, you sh just should do it. Or even if you think it's... You think it's an all right idea, but you're not sure if people are going to think it's bad. You don't know if it's a good idea. You should just do it and not wait around until you feel like you've thought of the best idea. Um, so there's that, but then also, and I say that because I've shown like everyone here my old paintings, and there are some just terrible ideas that are just <laughs> way, way too kitschy or like over dramatic or just you eventually settle into something that feels more you and more natural um, but then second is the stuff that you're drawn to and are copying really kind of like reverse engineer what about it you like and kind of reverse engineer it to figure out how you could do something similar
Okay. Let's make it funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cool with that? That's fine. All right, we're cool with that. All right. <laughs> All right, we're back. We're making sure this is 20. So everybody, you get a bonus 10 minutes extra tonight. Um, also, Brittany is uh, an entrepreneur of her own. She... Okay. It's okay. We getting anything saying no sound? No, we It's okay. All right, everybody. Sorry about that. We're back. We were just having a little bit of a technical difficulty. But we're ready to go. By the way, um, like I was saying, Brittany is, is her own entrepreneur. She has two companies that she runs. Um, are you in, you're in Durham, right? Or I'm in you, Raleigh. You're in Raleigh, okay. So here in Raleigh. Um, but I'm sure you ship everywhere. I do. Yes, okay. So she has a uh, swimwear line and a skincare, a, a body butter, right? Correct. Uh, line. Okay. And so y'all should check both of those out. We're going to put both of the, her uh, Instagram uh, addresses on... The thing, we, we do call them Instagram addresses, right? What do we like call Like a them? handle? Handle. Yeah. I was about to be like Instagram hashtag, and I was like, that's not a hashtag. What is it? Her at um, sign. Username. Her username. See, there you go. Username. Uh, you know, this, this, this old dog will still need to learn a few new tricks. So, um, but anyway, but she is a budding entrepreneur. Everybody go out and support her. Check out her Instagram pages. <laughs> there, yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. All right. Alex, you talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have really enjoyed having her here, though. She's been awesome. Thank you. No, it's our pleasure. Allison asks, for both artists, do you believe it is possible to make turning the form only with color slash temperature change without changing the value? I mean, small changes in planes, of course. Do we think it's possible that you, to keep the form intact while, while shifting your colors? Is that the is it, question? Is it possible to... Um, Turn the form with just color shift instead of value shift, basically. I think. Oh, so like he, turning the form with hue versus mm. um, with versus uh, value uh, or chroma versus value. Yes. Well, I will say. I mean, there are 
there's a hierarchy in your eye because of rods and cones that exist in your eye. So I'm going to go through like a little bit of the science here, but um, ro the rods in your eye are like your black and white receptors and your value receptors. So they are the ones that actually help you see at nighttime, and that's why things have less color at night because um, you see more in black and white with that. Uh, but it's your most powerful receptors. So obviously value is the most powerful way of creating the illusion of form because it is the primary way your eye can see. And then basically the secondary ways are with hue and chroma. Um, however, there are illusions that happen with our eyes when things are shifted from warm to cool that make things look like it's closer to you and further away. And that has to do with light refraction of your lenses in your eye. And uh, because things have longer waves and shorter waves. And then chroma, because of how light reacts with chroma and how we see, we see more chroma in things that have more light on them. So the long-winded answer is you can but it will be so subtle that uh, it will be hard to, to understand and differentiate. You would have to have everything in your painting completely flat, and it would be very, very hard to be able to turn, make form feel uh, voluminous. Um, but you can make it feel slightly voluminous, and it's, a, it's actually a good practice in compression that you can use it to your advantage with value. So like, if you're working on a painting and you have an area that you want to keep incredibly compressed, but you want to show some sort of subtle uh, shifts towards one way or the other, you can actually use warm and cool and chromatic and less chromatic to do just that. So, um, so that depends an answer is yes, but in most scenarios, it won't make sense, but actually it'll show a level of sophistication in the right areas if you know what you're doing. Yeah, I took from someone who's taken workshops from a lot of a la prima people. There is like this, definitely this thing where they feel like Sargent turned, made stuff look three-dimensional and like without, like in certain spots without value and just with color temperature. And I'm like, did you turn it black and white? Mm -hmm. Are you sure there's no value change there? But there's like some parts of like, I remember them showing some sergeant and how like a side plane of a forehead, it was just like a colder temperature shift mm -hmm. instead of like actually dark in value, but it still kind of looked dark in value to me. But I'm See? sure. There is like something to it, but to it's interesting to like, it was kind of like against using value to do it. It was interesting way of thinking. Yeah. Well, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> uh, Alex Tabbit says, what are some of the things you feel you would have never learned had you never attended an atelier? For Lewis. Well, I most certainly think that the way I learned how to understand form would have been very hard to learn without someone sharing with me how to learn it. Um, because even, even when there was um, instructors, it took, it took a month or two for me to really grasp what they were trying to say because they were basically kind of given me different ways of thinking about it for me to kind of like walk through the door. So the way I always described it is if you've ever looked at those old school like 3D like magic eye books and you like cross your eyes in just a certain way with all the little pixel dots, then all of a sudden you can see like a three-dimensional object kind of come from it. And like you'll struggle this whole time trying to figure out how like they're saying paint through the picture plane and carve as a sculptor would into the painting. And that's how you should be thinking about form because then you're using the advantage of the illusions your eyes uh, create. 
And like, and so like, it was really hard for you to get your mind to think that way and to see that way. And then one day, I'll call it your eureka moment where you're just sitting there and all of a sudden your drawing just kind of goes into space and you're like, oh! and you're like, okay, I'm gonna just not look away. If I don't look away, I'll be able to see this forever, you know? And then like, you look away and you lose it. And then like, it happens again the next day, but then you lose it. And then like, you start seeing it more often. And then you get to a point where you can't not see it. And it's a really cool place to be, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's a real exciting moment. Um, and so I don't think I would have ever learned that if I didn't go to an atelier uh, or have someone t teach it to me, you know, like I most certainly tried to share my best to the people here at East Stokes who haven't attended an atelier to like share that kind of thing with them so that they could learn it. Um, you know, so I do believe that if you have the person who has the knowledge to impart it onto you without an atelier, then that's totally doable and possible. Great question. Vaporwave asks, when you paint people who are at a distance or in the background, how do you judge how much detail they have, such like a face? Ooh. Uh, I think that like one way of, of judging is it really, for me, it kind of comes back to tricking the eye is like, does that feel further away than the object should with compared to everything else that's in the background and does it feel further away from the things that are in the foreground or do the foreground things feel close enough because it's all like this like illusion that we're trying to like create right well then go ahead and use the side of your mind that allows for you to use that um, to see with that illusion and i think it'll actually as simple as that sounds i actually think it can help What do you think, Bob? Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's totally like a preference thing, but definitely when stuff is in the background, less is more. And, there, and it's, I would just look at how other artists have simplified people in the background, like, like I can think of like someone who pulls off a lot of detail, even in like insignificant figures in the back really well is like Al Matadema. Mm. And I have a painting with just like a hundred figures in it and they all looked really rendered. But when you actually think about, okay, if that was a real human face, there's so much information kind of simplified and left out. And so yeah, it's like a personal preference based on what what you like, I guess, based on the other painters you like that do it. Mm. But, but definitely thinking like less, less detail falls into the back. Because if the guy, up, if the person up front was super blurry, but then the person in the back was, had a lot of detail, you would look at the person in the back. Yeah. Gail says, the quality of the skin in Alex's is velvety. It's really fascinating. Ooh, Thank velvety. You. you got velvety in <laughs> It's all that body butter. <laughs> yeah, if you want that. Yeah, check out that hashtag slash handle slash address <laughs> if you want that velvety skin. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's awesome. One thing we like to do here at East Oaks is have a lot of fun. <laughs> 
Um, Vaporwave says, what is each and everyone's favourite artist and or piece of art? Well. All right, Kristen, take it away. <laughs> Kristen. Well, I, I like too many artists to have one favourite. Um, I don't know. Contemporary or... Old master. Um, I'll just start naming names. Obviously, Bougaro. Um, <laughs> we got a cheer from the back. Um, <laughs> Alex actually showed me, I had never seen before, but Emile Friant is like amazing to me. Um, yeah, I like Clausen or mm, Bessie Lepage or. Um, recently with flowers, I've been looking at Phantom Latour. Um, but yeah, I I tend to look more at old masters than I do at um, contemporaries, although I'm very inspired by artists today. But if I'm looking for like compositional ideas and things like that, I just tend to go for the old masters. But um, yeah, like contemporaries would be... Um, like Nick Om and Alex <laughs> and <Yeah>. um, <laughs> like Jordan Sokol. Um, yeah, just the list goes on and on. I could sit for hours. And I don't really have like one particular piece. Um, I'd have to give you a list on that one too. So that's mine. <laughs> what she said <laughs> I feel like we all have the same taste so yeah we have we have very similar tastes here so she was speaking for all of us on behalf of all of us here <laughs> I'd like to give some kind of an answer but it is the same it's like just so many You don't even want to see all the saved images I have on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really like the way Solomon J. Solomon paints, and that's the book I recommended, Vaporwave. Um, yeah, there's just too many, and I'm trying to think of like one of my favorite paintings too. It's like so hard. I will say one of my favorites is Solomon J. Solomon's of Samson. That's a, to me just an insane painting. I love that painting. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. If you don't know it, do yourself a favor and look it up. Make it an even hour and we'll get to go. <laughs> oh, so many things I want to do. How important is the background when you guys are painting? Uh, well, uh, in these kinds of paintings, n not very, because considering that you have such limited time. But um, I would probably say in, in my, my main work that I do, uh, it, it plays a pretty significant role in what I um, create for people. 
Uh, I do a lot of commission work, and background plays a lot of roles in that. Yeah, I would say the same thing. It's like with this, mm, like doesn't matter, but in my paint, in like the paintings I do, the background is very important. And then there's some paintings where the background is less important when it's just a simple figure in the background. It's kind of just a one solid color or something. But even then you want to make it feel like the portrait has like an atmosphere around it. I think we're all sitting here like we have a minute left. We got we're concentrating deeply. <laughs> Want to have Brittany come back so we and keep painting on this and uh, capture that full beauty. Are we doing on time? We are 45 seconds. Jesus. <laughs> Get it, go, go. F fix the eye. <laughs> it's always like that. You're like, what? Okay, I can't fix that. That'll take another three hours so I can do this. You know, you start like saying, okay, well, with that amount of time, I can like, you know, put a few strokes in on her <laughs> outfit. <laughs> Go, Alex, go. Oh, yeah. One second and <laughs> All right. Yeah, to give us that. All right, everybody. <laughs> that was awesome. Y'all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you found it as enjoyable as we did. Uh, make sure to get the reference images if you haven't. Um, make sure you get the reference images if you haven't so that um, you can paint along with us. Uh, wait another 24 hours. I think it takes like a, a few hours, like eight hours or something for this to like go off and then reload back up to YouTube. So, um, but we'll continue doing these and we're going to try, we already have the ones scheduled for next month and the month after that, and they will be announced a little bit later. And also Scott Burdick is coming this weekend to do a live stream workshop with uh, East Oak Studio. If you want more information, make sure to go to eastoakstudio.com uh, or uh, Clink will also try to have a link below to uh, come. If you want to sign up, you can actually purchase it as a single uh, workshop or if you want, you can also uh, join as a member for uh, for 20, not 27, $27 a month. Uh, and you get access to all of our stuff, including the live streams that we do just for our subscribing audience. Um, as always, we appreciate you. and uh, Please give us feedback in any ways that we can help. And if you find this interesting, make sure to share it with somebody, subscribe and uh, click the little bell so that you're always alerted when we do live things. Thank you all again, and we'll talk to you soon.